Welcome back to the Lightning Podcast, a show dedicated to studying and enjoying God's Word, the Bible. I'm your host, Adam Castellino. The last few episodes, I've been going over the end times, and we're finally done with that. I hope that you have a chance to check out that series. Um, But this week, I have a lot I wanted to talk about. Um, So many things that are in my heart that I'm excited to share. Uh, Lord willing, we'll have time to get through as many of them as possible. But you may have noticed the title of this episode is The Dangers of Social Media. And normally in this podcast, I like to go over things in the Bible, a passage of scripture or or several passages of scripture to teach and to encourage you to study God's word and grow in your faith. And normally I don't really pay attention to what's going on in the world because that's not really relevant. But today I'm going to take something that is very common in our life and see what the Bible has to say about it. Uh, But before I get into that, there's a few other things I want to talk about. There's something that's been kind of stuck in my mind and my heart for a while that I just wanted to share Sometimes when you're reading the Bible or praying or meditating on God's Word throughout the day, there are things, and this will happen to you a lot throughout your life, that will just kind of keep coming back to your mind. They just, they're kind of stuck in your craw, so to speak. You can't get away from them. Whenever you're talking about the Bible or talking about God or even at church or anything like that, your mind always goes back to a certain verse or a certain topic, and you keep thinking about it, and you talk with friends about it, and you keep trying to decide what it means or what, how it applies to you. Well, that, my friends, is one of the ways... God speaks to us. You may have heard people say, oh, the Lord laid this on my heart, or the still small voice of the Lord. Those are different ways of expressing how the Holy Spirit will often communicate to us in our spirit. And he'll bring to to our memory a verse of scripture or a particular idea from the Bible so that we can meditate on it, think about it, talk about it to others and to ourselves so that we can grow in our understanding of that particular uh, verse or, or topic. If you're not familiar with how God speaks to you, there's there's one little nugget. There's many ways he communicates to us, all primarily through the word. And we are in a process as believers in learning and understanding how God speaks to us. A good verse about this is Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14. It says, But solid food belongs to those who are mature, who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. The New American Standard says, Because of practice... They have trained their senses to discern good and evil. And that is the path of maturity by practice through discernment. And discernment means to decide, to judge. We've learned what's right, what's wrong, what's good, what's evil. And so it's a process of learning the voice of the Lord through practice, by studying, by hearing something, thinking, is this from God? And then pursuing it and learning, yes, God's speaking to me. Or no, that was just my own thoughts. And sometimes that means taking a little bit of risk. Sometimes it means getting out of our comfort zone if you feel like God's leading us to go talk to someone or pray for someone. But we do that through practice, which means we sometimes mess up, but then we learn from that and grow. And God's very, very pleased when we take those steps of faith because it means we're prioritizing an attitude of listening to him rather than not listening to him, which is something that I'm going to touch on later in the podcast. So there was something that was in my heart for a, for a while. Whenever I'd think about the Bible or pray or study, this, this theme, this teaching came back to my mind. And it touches on how we study the Bible. I've mentioned this probably a few times in the podcast. And if you have a good Bible-believing pastor or teacher, or if you've done any kind of study and in, in reading and studying the Bible, you've come across some of these principles. But maybe it's new to you, so I'll explain a little bit. You may be wondering, how do we even study the Bible? How do we even understand it? How do we know um, to interpret it the right way? What if we're getting it all wrong? Well, the good news is there's some very practical principles that we could put into place for studying Scripture and making sure we know what it means instead of getting caught up in some sort of error or false teaching. The first one is always read Scripture in the proper context. This is not a big, profound thing, right? If you read uh, any book or any piece of material, you don't grab one little line from it and run off with it thinking this is what it means. You read that within the proper context to understand the whole picture. And that's what we do with the Bible. We don't just pluck one verse out of context and try to use it to justify or defend some wild teaching or doctrine or anything like that. This is especially true when we're talking about foundational doctrines of our faith, like Jesus Christ is the Son of God who died for our sins and rose again, or salvation through faith by grace. These are things that are foundational to what we believe, and so we 
we don't want people to distort them by taking a verse out of context. The same thing happens in real life. Sometimes you may have heard like a 30 second clip of someone saying something and you think, oh my goodness, I can't believe they said that or did that. But then when you watch the full clip or the full video or audio, you suddenly realize, oh, they took it out of context. It meant something very different. See, it's very easy for dishonest people to do that. They do that all the time with many things and same thing with the Bible. So we put everything into context. When people quote individual verses, or when we memorize individual verses, that's perfectly fine. But we do that because we understand what they mean because we studied the whole context and are now simply expressing the idea in that one verse. So we read the verse within the context of that surrounding passage, the surrounding passage in that chapter of the Bible, that chapter in the Bible within the surrounding chapters and the, the whole book of the Bible and the whole book of the Bible with the rest of the Bible. That's how we make sure that we're not distorting something from God's word. Another very common principle is we use the Bible to interpret the Bible. We study the Bible with the Bible. Now, as good as Bible commentaries and study resources are, as good as good teachers, and even this podcast can be, hopefully, for your understanding, we don't believe what the Bible says based on the authority of someone else. We look at what the Bible says, and then we look at what other passages of Scripture say to either corroborate that idea or to uh, debunk it. And that's what's really useful about cross-referencing tools. Your, your Bible might have little notes at the bottom with different passages of Scripture. And it, these are references to other places in the Bible where they say the same thing. And there's really good tools online to do even more thorough study on this. And that's why we study. If we're trying to understand this passage of Scripture, we look at what another passage says about the same theme. And we compare them and we gain a better understanding. That's the first steps, by the way, of a good, thorough Bible study. If you want to know how, how can I study the Bible, should I get this commentary or this book, get a good cross-referencing Bible or go online and get some good cross-referencing tools. And when you're studying a passage of Scripture, whether it's a whole chapter or something, then look, at, look up that passage with cross-references and see what other parts of the Bible say in relation to that teaching. And then you could take notes and see, well, Corinthians says this, but John says this, and the Psalms say this, and now I'm beginning to understand this idea. Those are some very foundational principles about studying the Bible. The, the one I wanted to focus on today comes from the Bible itself. Because you may be wondering, the Bible always talks about how important it is to study God's Word. Isn't there some sort of guidance or rule about studying it? How do, how do we go about doing that? Is there some secret code? Well, like everything else, God gives us the answer, and it's always a little more straightforward and clearer than we think. God is a deep, mysterious, amazing God who's wiser than all of our wisdom put together, but yet he communicates us in such a way that we could grasp it. Even little kids with faith can grasp it, as well as older, mature, quote-unquote, intelligent adults with faith can grasp it. The only thing that will prevent you from understanding is a lack of faith. Because if you reject that God is true, then there's no way you could learn from him. So this principle is found in the Old Testament and it's repeated again and again in the New. Deuteronomy 19.15 says this, A single witness shall not suffice against a person for any crime or for any wrong in connection with any offense that he has committed. Only on the evidence of two witnesses or of three witnesses shall a charge be established. Now this, this has become a very common principle we see throughout Judaism and even in the New Testament on the testimony of two or three witnesses, may a matter be established. That's how Paul just articulates it. Now, this was related to the, the judicial legal system in the Old Testament. You know, back then, obviously, they didn't have DNA evidence or cameras or photographic evidence. All you had was someone accusing someone else of a crime, and the judges had to decide, is this true or not? They couldn't simply take the testimony of the person against the other one because they might be lying. So you needed two or three unpartial, unbiased witnesses whose stories all line up for them to have confidence that this accusation was true. And even today's legal system, you there might not be evidence, there might not be DNA, but a witness testimony carries a lot of weight. And this, by the way, proves that the biblical system is innocent until proven guilty. They didn't immediately believe you were guilty just because someone said something. You needed legitimate testimony to back up that charge. And if any of the witness testimony conflicted or contradicted or didn't work out or weren't weren't consistent, then they threw all the charges out, even if the person was guilty, because they didn't want to wrongfully accuse anyone, especially when it came to a crime that brought about death. And so this principle isn't just about criminal courts and criminal systems. It also applies to establishing a matter. That's how Paul described it in 2 Corinthians. He said, every charge must be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. Jesus himself used that similar principle. And so we're going to use it when it comes to understanding scripture. 
may a matter be established on the testimony of two or three witnesses. So how does that apply to the Bible? Well, if someone comes to you teaching some sort of wild idea that's supposed to be some important key to your faith or doctrine, but they only have one thin passage of scripture to justify it, be very, very careful. Because if something is very important in scripture, God will put multiple accounts throughout the Bible testifying to that truth. And you may be wondering if you ever read the Bible through from Genesis all the way through the Revelation, you, there's certain things that are repeated again and again. The lives of the patriarchs like Abraham, the lives of David, there's certain themes about God and his justice and his righteousness that are repeated all the time. Why is God doing that? Well, because humans are forgetful and the Bible is written across many generations and he was reminding each generation of who he was, but also it fulfills this requirement on the testimony of two or three witnesses may a matter be established. Now think about that. God's standard is two or three reliable witnesses and it's true. Ask yourself, how many gospel books are there that testify of Christ's life, his ministry, his teachings, and his death and resurrection? There are four. So God set the standard of two or three and then he surpassed it to give us assurance that the gospel of Jesus Christ is completely 100% infallible, true, bulletproof. It is the word of God. That's how good God is. He sets a standard and then he surpasses it because he always does way more than what we need or that we could even expect because that's how good a God he is. And that's also true when it comes to studying scripture. When someone wants to teach something and you're not sure about it, if they can't find two or three legitimate accounts in the Bible to defend their position, especially if it seems a little strange, especially if it seems a bit off, then you should be very careful about accepting it as true. In most of the podcasts that I've done, I've gone through scripture and I'll quote many passages in many places to discuss whatever it is I'm talking about. I don't just pull one verse. People who do that, again, they might be taking out of context. They might be inventing their own pet theology, as I like to say, or some sort of error that could derail what you believe and create problems in your own personal spiritual life. In the recent podcast, I talked about things like uh, losing your salvation. There's no passage in scripture that says that a believer in Jesus Christ can sin and lose their salvation and go to hell. There's nothing that says that. But there are people who teach that. And, and they disagree with me. They call people like me, oh, we believe internal security, which somehow is almost like an insult. Like it implies that I'm saying you could sin all you want as a Christian and face no consequences. But I never said that. I said the Bible does not teach that a believer in Jesus Christ can lose their salvation because they've sinned. It's not in there. In fact, the Bible says there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Jesus said those who God puts into my hands, no one will snatch away. Hebrews says that Christ can save forever those who come to him. The Bible says our sins will be washed away. He's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. Again and again, the Bible makes it very clear that salvation is a gift from God by his grace that we receive. We cannot add to it. We cannot take away from it. And if you believe that your sin can somehow cause you to lose salvation, then you're saying that your sin is greater than Jesus' perfect work on the cross. How is that possible? Because Romans says in chapter 5, where sin abound, grace abounded all the more. It superseded any sin that you could commit. That's the grace that was released to us through Christ's death and resurrection. So there's nowhere in scripture that says if you're a Christian and you stumble in sin, and then you die before you repented or something, then you go to hell. It doesn't say that anywhere. And I challenge anyone to find two or three testimonies that can authoritatively prove that idea. Now they might grab one verse from the Old Testament and they'll say, see, under the Old Covenant, Israel sinned and God punished them. But even then they're being dishonest because nowhere in the Old Testament did God say, under the Old Covenant, if you sinned, I will send you to hell. Because remember, we're talking about hell. Under the Old Covenant, which is agreement between Israel and God through Moses, God had very specific conditions for them. And those conditions involved having faith in the one true God, being obedient to his commandments, and practicing the, the priestly rituals like sacrifice and so on, and many other commandments about their daily life. And if they strayed from that and specifically worshipped false gods, that was the main thing, the crux of all this, then God would eventually punish them for their sins. And the punishment involved the loss of their kingdom, being scattered from their land, the destruction of their cities and their homes, and ultimately physical death. But it doesn't say under those conditions, hell. Now, I'm not saying people who sinned in the Old Covenant didn't go to hell. 
What I'm saying is there's nowhere in Scripture where God says, I'm going to punish you by sending you to hell. Now, we know in Scripture, those whose names aren't written in the book of life, which is spoken of many times in the Bible, those whose names aren't written in there will go to the lake of fire forever. Well, how's your name written in the book? What's well, the Lamb's book of life, the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ. Those who put their faith in him have their names written and their names cannot be blotted out. That's what we know will happen. It's faith in Jesus Christ that determines your eternal destiny. But under the old covenant, God never said you're going to go to hell if you sin. He said you're going to face punishment in this life. But what happened in the next life, he didn't specify. We know in other parts of scripture what would happen. We all face judgment. The final judgment comes, we see at the end of Revelation, the great white throne judgment. Those who are in faith in Jesus Christ don't face that judgment. But those who don't face that judgment. So nowhere in the Old Testament does it say when the Israelites sinned, they went to hell. Again, I'm not saying that those without faith didn't go to hell. We're saved by faith back in the Old and the New Testament. But the punishments God specifically mentioned, he was very careful, right? Those under the covenant, when they sinned, they faced physical punishment, ultimately physical death. So a preacher today who comes to Christians who are an entirely different covenant, by the way, through Jesus Christ, and they say, just like Israel, God's going to punish you, they are A, taking out of context, B, attributing some judgment as other judgment, which is, again, biblical inaccuracy. And C, it's not us. It's not applicable to us. There's, you can't find two or three testimonies, especially in the New Testament, that if Christians sin, they're going to go to hell. They'll lose, quote-unquote, their salvation. That word's not there. And they may, again, quote other passages from the New Testament, again, by themselves to prove that God's going to punish them. But they nev it never says that a Christian sinning will go to hell. And what's really interesting is preachers who do preach this, they never explain what sin will cause you to go to hell, to what extent, how much, how often. They'll talk about, you know, oh, lust is sinful and, and lying and cheating are sinful and bad, but they'll never say, if you do it this many times, you go to hell. Or if you don't do this or don't do that, they go to hell. They'll, they, they imply that if you sin and keep sinning and don't repent at some point, you'll face punishment. But what does that mean? Like, you wake up in the morning, you're good, you mess up, and then you get into a car accident and die, but you didn't repent so you go to hell? I mean, is that the grace of God or is that just more legalism and works? That's never preached in the Bible. And they'll always keep it very vague. Why? Because their real goal is not to help you be saved, but to keep you dependent on them and their teachings rather than dependent on the word of God and Jesus. And again, you're not going to find that term anywhere in the Bible. And you're not going to find two or three reliable witnesses that teach a Christian who's born again can go to hell. Because even the Old Testament, God said, I would punish Israelites physically, but there was never mention of hell because that would come later. Now, just to reiterate, I've never said that a Christian could just go on sinning willfully without any intent of serving the Lord and face no consequences. That's not what the Bible says. I've never said it. Scripture's never said it. The Bible says we are forgiven of our sins. The matter of salvation, heaven or hell, has been decided through Jesus on the cross. But the New Testament makes it very clear that People who believe in Jesus are called to live a godly lifestyle, to abstain from sinful practices that we once engaged in before we came to Christ, and to pursue the fruit of the Spirit through our relationship with the Lord. And when we sin, we don't have to be defeated and corrupted and, and discouraged. We just pick ourselves back up and keep moving forward because we are forgiven. And a Christian who has sincere faith in Jesus and this rejects, you know, a, a godly life and doesn't study scripture and lives rebelliously and sinfully, they may not go to hell, but scripture makes it very clear that they will suffer loss. First Corinthians 3 goes into great detail about this, and Paul talks about it in other places. The judgment seat of Christ will stand before the Lord when he comes for his church and will face a trial, a test, a judgment that will test the merit, the quality of our inner life in Christ. And if we sought him and pursued a relationship with him, Obedient to his word and to his call for our life, we will, we're building on the foundation of Christ, gold, silver, precious stones, and we will receive a reward in eternity. But if we were just wild and crazy and sinful and disregarded God's word, we may have had faith in Jesus, but our life was inconsistent with his word. We weren't growing. Then we would suffer loss. Paul says our lives are like wood, hay, and straw that just burn up. He says very clearly the person will be saved, but as someone escaping the flames. He said they'll suffer loss. Because all this determines our role and reward in Christ's eternal kingdom. And I'm going to de delve into this a little bit more later on. But your life now determines your destiny in the future. Faith in Jesus saves you from hell and from the lake of fire. But God working through you from now until eternity will produce 
the rewards. So if you just sin wildly and disregard God's word and neglect him, yeah, you're not going to hell, but you're going to miss out on a whole lot, which is what this podcast is about, is to urge you to make use of your time on the earth faithfully with God so that you can enter and receive a wonderful reward from him. Again, that's what scripture says and it repeats it again and again. Jesus talked about that. Paul talked about that. Peter talked about that. He talked about being faithful to God and you receive the crown of life, of righteousness, and be seated on a throne and rule and reign with him. So if you are engaged in sinful behavior and neglect God's word, then you're going to miss out. That's what scripture says. Not hell, but a reward. So our motivation is joy. I want everything God has for me rather than fear. Oh, God's going to punish me. Because God has not given us a spirit of fear, as Paul says in Timothy, but of power, love, and a sound mind. That's why we bring everything back to Scripture. And if someone tries to throw at us some wild accusation or or doctrine or teaching that seems strange, ask them, give me two or three sound testimony, particularly from the New Testament, to prove what you're saying is true. If they can't do that, if they're just quoting one line out of somewhere and it's not backed up by Scripture, then you have to take it very, very carefully what they're saying. So this week, I want to talk about something that's on my heart. Um, Like I said, the title of this episode is The Dangers of Social Media. And it all ties back into the real purpose of this podcast, which is to motivate you to study God's Word so that you can be all that God has called you to be. The key to growth in your spiritual lives, first and foremost, is studying and meditating on God's Word. Everything else flows from that. You say prayer. Well, you can't pray in faith unless your faith is in God's word. How can you pray to God that you don't know anything about? How can you pray knowing he'll answer your prayers if you don't have the scriptures that say God will supply all your needs? He hears our prayers. He answers our prayers. Same thing with serving him, fellowshipping in the church, growing in every aspect of our lives. It's first founded on God's word. But let's talk about a little more why we're doing all this. If we're saved by grace through faith, it's not of ourselves. We don't earn it that the moment we come to faith in Jesus and are born again, that's it. We're going to heaven. We're going to be with him forever. It's a done deal. It's because it was paid for by Christ's blood. So what's the point of the rest of our life? Is it to have a nice, comfortable life here now? To become rich and get a fancy car and a big house or a nice career? Or to be popular or famous or just comfortable? I mean, if it's if we're already saved, then what's the rest of this life about? You know, or when, when we came to faith, why don't we just leave immediately and go to heaven? What's this whole time in, on the earth about? Well, one obvious answer, of course, is to be a witness to those around us. We are a witness of Jesus' saving power in our lives so we can share it with others so that they may come to faith. That's a big thing. And that's one of the largest purposes of the church, as Jesus said, go and make disciples of all nations. But there's more to it than that, because not all of us are going to be evangelists. Not all of us are going to be pastors or teachers. Some of us, we're all witnesses to our co-workers and our neighbors and our classmates and our family, but that might not be the main focus of our life and our ministry. So what else are we going to do with our life? Well, everything that we're going through right now is being used by God to cause us to grow. The Bible talks about uh, from the moment we come into faith to the time we leave this earth, we are in a process of sanctification or maturity that Paul talks about us growing in the image of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. God wants you to grow up. And I've said this a lot in different podcasts in different ways, but this is the point. When we come to faith, we are given a special opportunity. We were spiritually dead. Now our spirits are alive by the Holy Spirit. Now our inner person is growing and maturing. Paul says our, our physical bodies may be weakening, but our inner life is being renewed day by day. And that's the part of us that will enter into eternity. This physical body will pass away, we'll receive a new glorified physical body. But our spirits, our inner person, that's the real you, will live on and be tested. That's what it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. He's not testing our works, he's testing us. Because he said, you are the temple of God. And that temple, either built on gold, silver, or wood, hay, and straw, will be tested by fire. So how do we grow into the person that God wants us to be? Or first, what's the point? Well, I've mentioned it before, but it bears repeating that Christ is coming to establish God's kingdom on the earth. I talked about this during the end times episodes and other episodes as well. When Christ returns, he's going to establish God's kingdom on earth through Israel and the whole world will be renewed. As Peter said, the restoration of all things and all the earth will know uh, God is in control. And it's not just going to be him ruling. He's going to rule the whole earth. The whole earth will be populated with humanity. So he needs people to serve with him. So what kind of people 
are going to serve him. Angels? Well, no, angels are spirits that serve his purpose even now. But he wants people, human beings, were made to live on the earth. And he wants us to serve and work with him in that kingdom. Well, Jesus and Paul and Peter and James in the book of Revelation makes it very clear that those who put their faith in Jesus Christ will sit on thrones and rule and reign with Christ. Even Jesus said himself, he expressed it this way, I will let you sit on my throne as I sat on my father's throne. And again and again, there's this theme. Paul says it, Peter says it, James says it, that we will receive a crown. It's called at one place a crown of life, the crown of righteousness, the crown of glory. But it represents authority gifted to us through Christ. The Bible says in, in Peter and in Revelation, we are a nation of kings and priests. Peter writes, we are a royal priesthood, a holy nation. We have the authority of Christ gifted to us. Now, right now, we may not see that authority. It might be doled out to us in, in, in a measure of faith through prayer and intercession. But in that kingdom, we are going to rule and reign with him. Now, there's a lot about the reward we receive in eternity that we don't yet fully understand because it says in Scripture, No eye has seen, no ear has heard, nor has it entered into the heart of man what God has prepared for those who love him. We just don't know the full extent, but we do know a part of it is rule and reigning with Christ. And that may seem beyond your understanding, like, how can I be worthy of such a thing? You're not, okay? God is giving it to you because Jesus purchased it for you. Not just your, your forgiveness of sins, but your life as a child of God. And God is the king of the universe, and you as his child are a prince or a princess, and you are an heir of the kingdom. Now, because God can't die and give it to you like a, a, a normal king would, the inheritance comes when Christ returns to the earth. In fact, you receive it before that at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, which is a prelude to his return to the earth. And of course, the death did occur through Jesus Christ, but he rose again to give us this life. So your inheritance in God is ruling and reigning with Christ. You just have to accept that. That doesn't puff you with pride because we're not experiencing it right now. But it's an incentive for us to live this life now with a view to that future day. It may seem like a far off thing. It might seem like almost like a fairy tale or just a pipe dream, but that is what scripture says. If you're willing to believe Christ came first to die for our sins and rose again, which is in itself impossible apart from the work of God, then you should also believe that he will return to rule and reign and you will be there alongside him. In Acts chapter 1, when Jesus was taken up into heaven, an angel appeared and spoke to the apostles saying, why are you looking up into the sky? This same Jesus will return in the same way you saw him go. And we know that's going to happen one day soon. And we will be with him and we will enter that kingdom and receive a reward. So what we do right now determines that future reward. You may say, well, hey, I'm not some amazing minister or preacher or teacher. I'm not Billy Graham. I can't receive some great reward. Well, the Bible never says your reward is based on how popular you are or how big your ministry is or how famous you were or how many people you preach to. It doesn't say that. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 25, that each person is given a measure of gift, of talent, which was wealth, based according to their ability. So some people got more because they had more ability, and that was God's call. And some people got a little less. But each person went out and used it and doubled it and made the most of it, and they all received the same reward from God. The only people who have suffered punishment are people who completely rejected what God gave them was made available to them. And we see the implication of that is not just Christians, but unbelievers. Because if God has a gift for you and you bury it in the ground, that means you're not even receiving it. You rejected it, which is an unbeliever who doesn't believe in Jesus' gift of salvation and certainly hasn't received anything from him, even though it was made available to him. But every person who believes in Jesus, you've been gifted many things, but a call and a destiny that will be carried out throughout your entire life. From the moment you believed in Jesus, till right now, to the time you are no longer on this earth. And it might not be Billy Graham. That's fine. It might not be some great preacher or, or missionary. But God has a call on your life. And it's not so much about the amazing things you do externally, although God will have wonderful things for you to do in service to him. It's about the internal work he's producing in you. Because all the showy stuff can be faked. There are preachers who are preaching right now and might be thought of as amazing leaders. And oh, they're so wise and intelligent. But they might be exposed as frauds. In fact, in recent years, very sadly, there have been a number of 
well-known pastors and worship leaders and other people in the church who either were exposed for shocking behavior or were no longer even believers. They say, we're not Christians, I'm an atheist or whatever. Now, whether or not they're, I can't speak of their hearts, what they truly believe, but that is an evidence that just because you're in church and in ministry doesn't mean you're being faithful to God. So put aside all these notions that serving God means doing all these big things or sacrifice or all that stuff. Serving the Lord means being faithful to Him in the areas that God has placed you. And that means, first and foremost, your spiritual growth and maturity. You may never preach to a crowd of people, but God's more concerned with your maturity and the inner person. That means not only is your faith growing, but your wisdom, your, your patience, your humility. What did Paul call the fruit of the Spirit? Preaching to lots of people? No. Was it power to perform miracles? No. This was the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians chapter 6. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. That's what God is looking for as the fruit of his work in your life. And he said, walk by the Spirit and you'll produce this fruit. And in previous podcasts, I explained in in very simple terms what does it mean to walk or live by the Spirit. It means to be taught by God's Holy Spirit how to live according to His Word. That's what it means. There's more to it than that, of course. There's other dynamics, but that's the foundation. To walk by the Spirit means to allow God to teach you from His Word. And that will produce the love, the joy, the peace, all the other fruit. And if those things are appearing in your life, That is a sign, just like fruit is a sign, that there is good spiritual growth going on inside you. Yeah, you'll still make mistakes. You'll still stumble and trip up from day to day. You'll still feel weak at times. You'll still feel like you're discouraged or upset. But if there is love and those fruit growing in your life, because those fruit were evidenced in Jesus, study the life of Jesus in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and you'll see him abounding in those fruit. Because that's the whole point. If you're going to rule and reign with Christ in his kingdom, then you got to be as much like Jesus as possible so that he can trust you with authority. And if you fall short in some area, then you got to grow. You got to mature. And it starts by studying and meditating on his word. Now, why does it start with God's word? And what does that have to do with the things of this world? Well, it's very important because there's two paths you can take and only two. Jesus described the path of salvation as a narrow road and the path of destruction as a wide, broad path. And we see the world wants us to take that broad, wide path. And there's many ways there. Lots of false religions, false beliefs, different lifestyles, different ways of living that all lead to destruction. But there's only one path that leads to life, and that is faith in Jesus Christ. And we continue on that path as we study his word. The Bible says in John chapter 1, He, Jesus, is the word of God. So that when we study the Bible, the physical word of God we have with us here, we are learning about Jesus. And that is how we mature and grow. Because the battle going on right now, it's not about the things that you are real concerned with in the world right now. Whatever's going on. And as we certainly know, this year has been a completely crazy, unpredictable year. And you might be swept up in all these different things and personal things and global things. and But you have to understand the real battle is for your mind. What you're focusing on day to day will determine what you believe and that will affect how you live your life and whether or not you're growing in the Lord. Everything we do on a daily basis can either draw us closer to God or it could prevent us from growing in God. Now that doesn't mean everything is evil or bad. There are some things that are just monotonous. We do them and they're not necessarily good or bad. You know, we get up in the morning, brush our teeth. Okay, That may not necessarily draw us closer to the Lord, nor is it sinful, you know. Those are little things, but most of what we do, how we live our life, what we engage in, the relationship we have, how we react to problems, what we fill our free time with, how we relate to our job, all those things can either be a path of growth or they can be a hindrance. Now, there are some things in our life that aren't necessarily bad, but they're not fruitful. Growing up, since I was a little kid, I loved video games, and I had all the different consoles and gadgets all through my life and even now I have a few of them and when I was younger I would spend a lot of time playing these video games and I'm not someone who thinks that all it's evil it's bad you shouldn't play them there are some that definitely are are, have very dark content and I wouldn't want to play them and don't want to expose myself to them but the actual act of playing a game it's an amusement it's an attraction it's not inherently bad but as I've gotten older 
and I've had other things in my life that I care more about, I've found myself playing games less and less. They're not inherently bad, but I've always lo- I've learned that there's nothing fruitful in my time playing them. Again, I'm not saying you shouldn't play them or they're evil or whatever, but I only have so many hours in the day, and aside from my day job that I take care of, and aside from other responsibilities that I have, I only have so much free time, and I'd rather spend it on things that are more beneficial to me. And maybe I spend a little less time playing video games. And that's true for a lot of other things in our life. And we have to decide for ourselves, is this something that is beneficial or is it a deterrence? Paul says in 1 Corinthians, all things are lawful, but not all things are beneficial. I can do what I want, but I'm not going to let anything become a master over me. So there are things in our life we have to, to take a hard look at and decide, is this beneficial for my spiritual life or can I give it up? Or maybe use it less or engage in it less. Some people are obsessed with exercise and they do it far too much. Yeah, it's great they're healthy, but it's taking up so much of their time that it should be spending on other things. And that's true for any amusement. That's true for many, many activities. And that's certainly true for social media. Now, growing up in church, I've always been told about the dangers of television and the, and the radio and then all these media outlets. And it was a lot simpler back then, right? Because if you wanted to tune them all out, you just turned off the TV. You didn't read the newspaper, you didn't turn on the radio, you didn't go see those things, and you were fine, and you could spend your time in other things. But now it's so much harder. It's so much more intense because it's right there in our pockets. We subscribe to all these different apps and services and YouTube and Facebook and Twitter and all these things, and they have notifications that are constantly bombarding you. And the very way they're structured, it's never-ending. You could sit down on TV and watch a news program, and it's 30 minutes long, an hour long, and then it's over. But social media is never ending. It's an endless feed that could consume so much of your time. And it's not inherently bad. I'm not saying you shouldn't engage in social media. I use it. That's how I promote this podcast. I have a Facebook page. And then I use other occasional media outlets. The problem is when it begins to shape how we think about ourselves and about our world. This year alone has been such a powerful example of how we need to tune out from the world and what it has to say. And you can say, well, I don't listen to the world. I'm not watching those programs and I'm not listening to these people. I'm not listening to that. But how much of your uh, social media feed is nothing but worldly nonsense? And this hit me the other day. I was, I had my phone out and I was listening to some music from a particular artist I recently got into. And I enjoyed some of his songs, and I thought, well, I wonder if he has anything new. And my thought occurred to me, oh, let me see if he's on, you know, this XYZ media, social media. And that immediately hit me, like, why do I care? Why do I care? Like, I like some of his music. That's it. I don't need to be updated every few minutes of this guy's every thought and emotion. And it began to dawn on me that that's all that social media is. It's an endless stream of other people's thoughts, opinions, fears, anxieties, anger, hate. And, you know, initially it was a good thing because you could keep in touch with friends occasionally. Back in the day uh, when it was just MySpace, some of you may not even remember that. It was a very straightforward thing. You create the page, you connect it with old friends, and then you would occasionally send them little messages and that was it. But now... Facebook and some of the other things came to popularity as the mobile internet exploded. And now we're constantly looking at it all the time on our phones, in our pockets, throughout the day. And if you have notifications turned on, you're constantly bombarded with all these things. That's not to even mention email and text and all that other stuff. And it's no longer a great way to occasionally catch up with old friends. It's now a constant bombardment of noise that you don't need in your life, especially this year. So many people were whipped up into fear and frenzy over uh, the global pandemic stuff because they were just constantly staring at their phones. This Twitter, that Twitter, that post, that post, that video, that da 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 And it overwhelmed them because you're not looking for information. You're not getting objective facts. You're getting the opinions and fears of people who by and large are not of God who are writing from a worldly perspective that has been corrupted by sin and the enemy, and you are absorbing that stuff, and it's going to influence the way you look at the world. And it is going to have a negative impact on your mind. The world will say, oh, it affects mental health. And there have been studies that show people who are obsessed or spend too much time with social media, it affects your mental health. But we know it has an impact on our spiritual life. Our spirits, like our bodies, need to be fed something. Our physical bodies need food to give us energy to live. Our spirits, the place of our faith, needs to be fed something to believe in, and it needs the Word of God. 
But when we feed it a constant diet of negative attitudes, of fear, of the opinions of the people, they're not even remotely true. They're just the nonsense that comes from some other person's head. They may even be a friend or a coworker. Normally, you would never even know they thought or felt this way because they keep it to themselves. But because of the social media, they have to constantly update. So they're always posting this nonsense. So you're being exposed to stuff that you, you know, just 10 years ago would have never even known about. And you would have been fine. You don't need to know about it. The same thing with breaking news or news concerning our world. You think, well, this is all important stuff. You don't need to know everything that's happening every five seconds of the day all over the world, whether it's in your country or another country or your community, you don't need to know it. Because chances are what you're reading isn't even remotely true. Trust me, I know. I work uh, for several news sites and I know what's real and legitimate news. And I know that 99% of it is not factual or is largely distorted to get you to think or feel certain things that will distract you from God and focus on this corrupted world that will pass away in a blink. You may say, well, this is important stuff. It's the pandemic. It's the election. It's this riots. This this unrest in Europe. It's this war going on here. It's not important enough to get you focused on the world other than the word of God. Because stuff's happening all over the world. It's totally out of your control. Once something's out of your control, why are you so obsessed with it? It's like people who are, who are obsessed with celebrity gossip. Of, oh, so-and-so did this. So-and-so did that. Like, it's filling an empty void in their own life. It has nothing to do with them. It's not their life. It's not their relationship. They're not better or worse if some celebrity marries or divorces someone else. But they're obsessed with it, and it's a distraction from what really matters in their life, which is their relationship with Jesus through studying and meditating on the Word of God. This is so important because right now you could easily get overwhelmed by what's pe what people are saying about this issue and that issue, and you're consumed with things that will not produce the fruit we talked about. What will produce that fruit? Meditating on God's word every day and seeking what he has to say for you. I started this episode talking about how he put something on my heart and it just kind of stuck there and I wanted to share it. That can't happen unless I give God an opportunity to speak to me through studying his word. You don't need 10 hours a day to do it. Read a little bit of scripture in the morning and then hold on to that throughout the day. Think about it. Talk about it. Pray about it. Talk to yourself about it. That's meditation. Keep your mind focused on that. Then on all the nonsense that's going on in this fallen world. I did an episode once called Let the Dead Bury the Dead. And that means let the people of this world who don't know God be consumed with their own fights and bitterness, bitterness and bickering and all that nonsense. Let us be focused on God's eternal kingdom and what God is doing for us and in us right now. But you may say, these are important issues. If it's out of your hands, it's out of your hands. Bring it to God in prayer. Release it to Him in prayer. Receive the peace that comes through prayer. And then move on with God. what God has for you. Psalm 119, 105. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. That's what we should be focusing on. Proverbs 3, 5. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him and He will make your path straight. 2 Peter 1, verse 19. And so we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. This is what we need to be focusing on. Again, on the account of two or three witnesses, here's three really good witnesses teaching you to focus on God's word. It is the light that will guide you. Do not trust in your own understanding. Let's go back over Proverbs chapter 3. It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. Well, how can you trust in the Lord? By listening to what he is saying. What does his word say about your situation? What does his word say about the problems going on in your life? What does his word say that you should be doing at this moment right here, right now? It is to look at all what these morons say on Twitter? Or is it to focus on God's word and his promises and his love for you? Or maybe it's to put down your phone and stop being concerned with that nonsense and go share your love of Jesus with a friend or a family member. Or maybe to spend more time in prayer about your community or the things in your life or just spending time worshiping him because that will be more refreshing than constantly being updated by nonsense. There's nothing wrong with these things, just like I said with video games. But when they become something that has a negative impact on your spiritual development, you have to take a very hard look at them and say, I'm going to cut this out of my life. Jesus had a very profound teaching where he said, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. If your eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. Now, hey, your hand can't cause you to sin. Your eyes can't cause you to sin. So clearly, you're not, we're not chopping parts of our bodies off. They don't cause us to sin. But the things in our life 
that will take our eyes off Jesus and become consumed with the thoughts and impressions of this wicked world, those things we need to cut off and get rid of. I'm not saying you shouldn't use social media. What I'm saying is you need to take a hard look at it and decide, is this producing faith that will cause me to grow into that person God's called me to be? Or is this producing more fear, anxiety, anger, hate, division, strife? None of those things are from God. And if it's something that's producing that in you, you got to eliminate it from your life. Now is so important. This year, has, if it's taught us anything, it's to put our trust in God's word and reject the lies of the enemy. The world will come and things will be good, things will be bad, things will improve, things will get worse. That, that's the way the world, it's fallen, it's corrupt, it's all going to fade away. So we can't be swept up in everything that's happening day by day. We need to be grounded on what God is saying to us. And the only way we can do that is by focusing on his word, even if we have to get hostile and just completely turn everything off. The other day I was getting bombarded by texts from people asking me about my opinion on different things. And it was just a distraction. I had nothing to say to them. So I literally just turned off my phone and spent time in God's presence and spent time with my loving wife. And that's what I did. I eventually got back to people and and responded, but I just did not want to get so bombarded by nonsense that it derailed what God had for me in that moment. Friends, this is the proof of the pudding. This is the stuff that said in Hebrews that practice needs to be taking place so that you could discern between good and evil. This is where the rubber meets the road. A fair-weather Christian will get swept up and won't even listen to what I'm saying and they won't grow. But if you're serious about your relationship with God, you will begin to make these decisions. You will prioritize studying God's word and knowing him more than being consumed with all the nonsense in our society. And it's very alluring because we keep thinking, oh, it's important, this issue is important. It's not so important that you get derailed by fear, by hate, by anger, by any of those things. And if it's beyond your ability to control, then clearly it's in God's hands. And you need to trust it to him and focus on what he has for you. Nothing in this world is so important that it's more important than the things that God has. And you're going to know what he has for you by studying his word and seeking him by faith, allowing the Holy Spirit to speak to you. So in a practical steps, what do you do? We'll take a hard look at social media, if you use it, and decide, is this useful? Is this not? It might just mean just turning it off for a week or a month. It might mean deleting a few accounts. Some of you, you might be stumbling into sin because whenever you open up that thing, you see stuff that's no good. Delete it. Delete it. Just like Jesus said. It's better for you to delete it than to keep stumbling into sin. And if there's things, there's people there, just eliminate it. Take a break. Take a break. Stop. Turn off the TV. Turn off the Netflix. Stop listening to turn off notifications, and just spend time in God's presence. Whether it's a day, or maybe a month, or maybe six months, you'll feel so much better. And you realize, I didn't need that garbage. What I did need is more of God's word. Because trust me, friends, we're in a battle. And the enemy wants us to be so consumed with his propaganda and his lies that we're not being useful for God. Satan would love nothing more for you to be overwhelmed by the noise of this world and neglect the gift that God has given you in his word. Switch off the the news, switch off the media, and get back into his word. And if people ask you questions about stuff, say, I don't know about that. All I know is Jesus. That might seem silly. That might seem unrealistic. But trust me, there will come a time when all these problems are gone. Those things don't matter. And all that will matter is Jesus. And people look to you and say, wow, I wish I was so focused on Jesus as you were back then. Every episode of Lightning Podcast is on our website, lightningpodcast.org, also on Spotify, iTunes, YouTube, and Facebook. See you next time.